Well, as it turns out, there's a whole dang a lot of people on this planet. They all find that their hunger gets aroused on the daily. So it's a good thing that we figured out agricultural methods capable of stuffing all those rumbly tumblies. But to put it mildly, producing all that food ain't easy. So let's consider in this video the challenges of contemporary agriculture. And if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, Let's get to it. So let me start by explaining the basic debate that rages over contemporary agriculture. There are a metric buttload of mouth holes in this world and they all want to be fed. And as it turns out, the agricultural practices that we've developed over the last century are more than capable of feeding and even overfeeding every wanting mouth hole on God's green earth. So if we just let the farmers and ranchers do their thing without any restrictions, we'd have so much food that even the least of us would be living like sultans. And that's great, right? Like how could there be a debate about that? Well, as it further turns out, many modern agricultural practices are so destructive to the land that left unchecked, all the world's agricultural land will quickly dry up and resemble an old trucker's elbow. So the debate is this, how do we feed a global population while simultaneously preserving the health of agricultural regions for the use of future generations? Oh, and by the way, if you want no guys to follow along with this video and all my videos, check the link in the description. Anyway, there are two illustrations of this debate that you're gonna need to know. First is the debate over genetically modified organisms, also known as GMOs. Now these are crops that have their DNA altered in a lab making them more resistant to disease and drought, and bonus, they produce higher crop yields. And since their introduction in the 1990s, GMOs have diffused widely throughout the world and have fed a lot of people. But critics argue that since a much greater amount of chemicals are required to produce those higher yields, GMOs are dangerous both to the environment and to the humans who eat them. Wah, wah. Okay, the second illustration of this debate concerns aquaculture, which refers to the cultivation of aquatic organisms for consumption, like fish or oysters. And as it turns out, a huge portion of the fish many of us eat is grown in these these kind of fish farms. However, critics argue that since these aquatic farms require huge inputs of energy and chemicals, aquaculture can pollute neighboring water sources. Additionally, toxins can be found in farmed fish that can be dangerous for humans to consume. And I don't know about you, but I like my fish fillet with the triple superphosphate on the side. Okay, now another challenge of contemporary agriculture is the various changes in patterns of food consumption and production. In other words, when people decide they want different foods or they change their preferences and how those foods are grown, that has a big effect on choices that farmers and ranchers make. And I hate to be the one to tell you, but there are no less than six illustrations of this trend that you need to know. So gird thyself and I'll tell you what they are. Now first we have the rise of urban farming, which is the practice of growing fruits and vegetables on small plots of land within cities. Especially in less developed cities, millions of city dwellers have created gardens that yield enough fruits, vegetables, meat, and milk to feed themselves and often have surplus to sell locally. For example, in China, urban farming produces about 90% of all fruits and vegetables consumed in its major urban centers. And this kind of intensive farming is at least a partial solution to the problem of limited access to nutritious foods in the world's major cities. Second, we have the increasing prevalence of community-supported agriculture, or CSA. In this arrangement, farmers and consumers enter into an agreement with each other in which consumers pay a subscription fee for a guaranteed share of the farmer's crop. Therefore, consumers have have input on what kinds of crops will be grown and the farmers respond because they have guaranteed buyers for their produce. And in large part, these relationships are established and maintained at local farmers markets. And then third, we have an increasing demand for organic farming, which is a method of farming and ranching that uses only natural and renewable resources. And this trend began in earnest in the 1960s and 70s as a reaction to the potential environmental and health hazards created by commercial chemical heavy farming techniques. And since then, policies have been created that allow organic products to be distinguished from other products, and though they're more expensive, many consumers are willing to pay a higher price knowing that their food is produced without the use of all those stanky agrochemicals. Fourth, farmers are increasingly specializing in value-added specialty crops. Essentially, this refers to an agricultural product that is transformed into another related product, like for example, milk processed into cheese and yogurt and ice cream. You see, because farmers' incomes have long been in decline, many have tried this new way of producing desirable products for direct-to-consumer sales. And although the prices are higher for these products, many consumers are willing to pay those higher prices because they know that these products were produced sustainably. And fifth, the fair trade movement has grown in popularity. Here, consumers decide only to buy products that are labeled fair trade, and in this way, they know that the farmers who produce those goods are being paid a fair wage. And as this movement expands, it can incentivize farmers in the developing world to change their practices in order to qualify as a free trade supplier. And finally, sixth, local food movements have become more prominent. Here, consumers buy food that is produced in their local community, not only because it's fresher, but also because it's not dependent on worldwide shipping and all those fossil fuels required to do so. Okay, so we've already established that our modern agriculture agricultural methods and technologies are more than capable of feeding every dang human being on the planet. And not only is it just capable, like on the whole, we actually produce enough food for everyone on the planet to be well fed. But as you may or may not know, everyone is not in fact well fed. Much hunger still exists in the world and that's because the world's food is not evenly distributed. And here comes some more bad news. There are five required illustrations of this trend and... <laughs> 
I'm sorry. Now, first, we have widespread food insecurity, which describes people who experience long periods of unbalanced diets. And to be clear, food insecurity occurs in both developing and developed countries. And so, when people don't have enough money to buy a variety of nutritious foods, they will often opt for cheap processed food, which over time can lead to illness and premature death. And that leads us to our second issue, namely food deserts, which describe places in which people lack access to nutritious food. And these are mainly found among the impoverished without adequate transportation and money to purchase the variety of foods that would create a healthy diet. And then the third challenge for feeding a global population has to do with problems with distribution systems. So, not surprisingly, in order to get food to everyone who needs it, working distribution systems are required, including seaports and roads and rail lines. And in many cases, the majority of hungry people in the world live in isolated rural areas in developing countries that lack good infrastructure to deliver food to them. And the fourth challenge to feeding everybody is adverse weather. Like, sometimes whole crops can be lost if the weather doesn't cooperate, like in cases of extended drought or flooding. Now, in core countries, many farmers have crop insurance that protects them financially if their crops fail. But in many other places, especially those former colonies who depend on an export economy, that kind of insurance doesn't exist, or the farmer couldn't afford it if it did exist. So if adverse weather destroys their crops, it can be devastating to their population and economy. And then fifth, land loss to suburbanization presents a growing challenge to feeding a global population as well. As urban populations grow, many people decide to move outward to the suburbs where housing is cheaper and more abundant land is available. However, as suburbanization continues to increase, that land is no longer available for farming, which can lead to a decrease in production and more expensive food, all of which puts more pressure on poorer populations to find the food they need. And last of all, let's get sassy and talk about the economic challenges of feeding a global population. And, you know, I guess this is good news because there are only four required examples here, so, you know, <laughs> woohoo. The first economic challenge is the location of food processing facilities and markets. So, food processing is the task of transforming agricultural products into food or transforming one kind of food into another. And in developed countries with good infrastructure, agricultural products can be shipped to processing facilities with relative ease and with little loss. However, in developing countries with lack of good infrastructure, the difficulty of transporting goods to processing facilities can lead to much more significant loss of their crops along the way. Second, farmers face the challenge of economies of scale. So farmers may alter their practices to take advantage of economies of scale, which allows them to bring in greater profits. For example, a small farmer may choose to spend 10% more on fertilizers and irrigation, but the greater yield means that the farmer's cost per unit decreases and the profits will often be greater than the extra cost, so that's you know, a good thing for them. Third, the presence or lack of efficient distribution systems can affect the decisions farmers make as well. For example, on the global scale, one of the most critical parts of a distribution system is storage facilities. And this ought to blow your mind. Something like a quarter of the world's food is lost because adequate storage isn't available. Like milk spoils before it's processed or pests devour unprotected grain or whatever. So when they consider selling their goods on the market, farmers must consider if their destinations have proper storage facilities. And finally, fourth, government policies can affect the nature of agriculture as well. For example, in the United States, the federal government grants subsidies to farmers who grow three vital crops, namely corn, soybeans, and wheat. And Big Daddy government does this because those three crops are vital to all kinds of economic activity, including, you know, eating, but also using crops for many other products as well. And so those subsidies can influence farmers' decisions by incentivizing overproduction and maximization of profits at the cost of diversification and sustainability. All right, good job sticking with me through that one. And you can click here to keep reviewing for Unit 5, and you can click here to grab my video note guides, which are going to help you get all the content of this course firmly crammed into your brain, folks. And I'll catch you on the flip-flop. I'm Lur out.